Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all here. It's interesting, uh, the scripture we hear this morning is talking about fears. Um, first, I want to thank Avery for singing. A wonderful job. Um, I was mentioning the last time he came and sang with us it was during a Christmas event. He sang Ave Maria, and he's grown about that much <laughs> since we saw him on it. So, welcome anytime. It's time to share your music talent with us. As we hear the story and talk to the children about fears, I think it's interesting to note that more people are afraid of being in public, in the public eye, rather than dying. More people are afraid of being in public than dying. So what we're saying is many people would rather die than come and sing, Avery. <laughs> but we're glad that you're willing to step up and, and, and do that. So the New Scripture helps us to understand a little bit about where Jesus is with the disciples. Where I think it's interesting in just understanding the scripture is we have just heard the story of how Jesus and the disciples had just fed 5,000 people. And so Jesus encourages the disciples to get into a boat and to go on ahead of him. He has some other things he needs to do. And then he dismisses the crowd so that he's all by himself. And what's interesting is that they have a destination in mind. In the next passage, they go to the city on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, this uh, little place, little town called Gennesaret, and they're on their way. And I know that as I was considering this passage, I was recognizing that for me, I'm almost always thinking about what is that next step, what is that next event or thing that I'm going to do, what is that next thing on my agenda. But this passage happens along the way, between two events. It is where they are going to, and it's on the way to where they're going that stuff happens. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but sometimes in life it's really not the destination that defines you, but it's really the way in which you experience the journey that begins to define who you are and how you experience that. I remember with uh, my family, sometimes we took long summer uh, trips, we often did some camping, and it was the events that happened in the car that became the stories that we told later on. It was about how much space was between my sister and I in between the bench seat and the back of the car, which tend to shrink over long journeys. I don't know how that works. Cars need to figure that out, manufacturers, but their cars shrink the longer the journey is. I'm not sure how that happens. But it is that along the journey experience that the disciples begin to experience something of Jesus that they didn't know either before or after, and they actually come to an understanding of Jesus that is very unique in this passage. I'm hearing a little bit of buzz on the, on the microphone. So as we think about where we are on the journey, I recognize that between this place and wherever it is that we think we're going next in life, we often have the experience of the wind that the disciples see. They got on the boat and they started to make their way to the next location where they're going next, but it says because of the waves, because of the wind that was battering the boat with the waves, they couldn't make the forward progress that they hoped to make. They had hoped to already been there four hours later, but they realized they were only halfway there because of all the wind that was coming against them on their way to Gennesaret. And I know that there's this frustration that happens when you think you're going to go someplace. You think you're on your way, and by the time you thought you should have been there already, stuff along the way has somehow come into play so you can't actually get the job done, you can't actually get there. And that a whole lot speaks about life, and that we, it always takes me a lot longer to get something done than I think it will. My wife will tell you that I say, it's just going to take me 10 minutes. And she's like, 20 minutes later, David, what, yeah, let's get going, you know, what's going on? But sometimes we find ourselves incredibly frustrated by the fact that life just keeps on throwing difficulties at us. We get one thing taken care of, and next thing you know, another thing crops up. And it's sometimes it's these unexpected, unforeseen things that drive all, of our, drive all of our attention to focus on those things that are coming about. And sometimes the unexpected are hugely dramatic events. Whether it's the death of somebody in our family, our life story, Perhaps it's a financial trouble. Perhaps our uh, job gets lost. Perhaps there's you know, a water main break in our house. <laughs> Something happens that we don't expect, and it causes us to wonder, are we ever going to make it? Is there an end to this journey? Are we, is there ever an end to the struggle that I'm having? And sometimes we're just deeply afraid. 
Is there some peace in the midst of life's journey that just keeps throwing things at me? Where do I find peace in the midst of all this craziness? And I think the disciples were experiencing some of that as they got in the boat, and they're halfway there, and they still haven't gotten to their destination. And then, night happens. It's dark. I'm not sure if you've ever been on a stormy sea at night, but that's kind of an earth-shaking experience. <laughs> when you're not sure if you're going to get to where you're going to go, and the sea is a mess with all the waves up and down, we know that it's very difficult. And so the disciples begin to try their best to get to their next location. They're, they're uh, putting down the sail, they're pulling out the oars, and they're trying to get there. And as they're in the midst of their storm, they see Jesus walking out on the water towards them. Now, the disciples don't know how to make sense of this. I'm not sure if you have a way of making sense of Jesus on the water, water, but if you were out there on a boat in the middle of, let's say, out here in the Pacific, you're on a boat and you see Jesus walking on the water, something's going to happen to your gut. Like, what in the world is going on out there? And so the disciples use the only phrase that seems to make any sense to them. It can't be Jesus. It has to be some ghost out there. Some weird thing is happening in their lives. And I think what's interesting is that Jesus does show up in some weird ways in our lives. And sometimes we don't have any way of making sense of it. We use whatever classification we can. You know, it's a ghost or you know, it's maybe a bad piece of lunch. But we, we put some weird phrase to the fact that somehow God is turbulently changing something that's going on in our lives. And we go, where in the world is God? And the disciples cry out in fear. They're afraid that whatever's going to happen, this swell, the, perhaps this apparition, is a, a messenger, that they're going to die. And they're afraid. What's going to happen to us? Well, I think in the midst of this, we hear the statement of Jesus, who simply says the phrase, Do not be afraid. It is I. Take part. Now, I think it's critical about what Jesus is saying here isn't just that he's telling them to not be afraid. But he's giving them the reason for their need not to be afraid. And that is that he is present with them. He says, it is I. What's amazing about everything that God does for us is that God wants us to know more than anything else, regardless of life situations, that God is with us. It is I. I care about you. I love you. I am with you. There's a song on the radio from the Goo Goo Dolls, uh, the song Iris. And in this chorus line that it has of this song, it says, In the midst of everything that's made to be broken, I just want you to know who I am. Now, the singer's not necessarily talking about a relationship with God. But when I heard that, it really struck me that this is God's message to us. That when we realize that everything that surrounds us is temporary, everything around us is made to be broken, that the ultimate message that God wants us to hear is, I just want you to know who I am. God, in His purposes for us, the primary purpose for our life isn't to get a bunch of stuff done. Believe it or not. It's not about your accomplishments. It's not about the amount of money that you accumulate, nor about the relationships you develop. It's about coming to know God. God says, in the midst of everything else that's made to be broken, I just want you to know who I am. In the midst of our turbulent life, when you find yourself in the midst of storms, in the midst of troubles, are you taking a moment to ask the question, Lord, where are you? Who are you in my life? It's good to ask that question. It's good to be seeking and questing after God. And we don't get it all right. And I think that's one of the things I hear about the story when we see this example of Peter. What a great example this guy is. A guy whose heart is after God, but who makes more mistakes than any of the disciples combined. At least according to what we have written here. But he's willing to put his foot in his mouth over and over again because his desire is come to know Christ. And he's the only disciple in the boat who speaks up after hearing Jesus' statement. He says, Jesus, if that's really you, Ask me to come out to be with you. And Jesus says, come. And I think what's great about this little example from Peter is that when we are finding ourselves in the midst of the storms of life, it's good to ask the question, is this God? Or where is God in the midst of my storms of life? Where do we find God? I think it's a great experience for us to keep trying. 
keep asking. And I think this is part of that discernment process. How do we really begin to tune our ears to hear God's voice? How do we really shape our heart to be able to hear and feel the presence of God? Well, it comes through a process of trial and error. It really does. God desires so much for us to come to know Him that He wants us to keep trying. He wants us to pursue Him. In the same way that one person might pursue another in a loving relationship, trying over and over many different ways to get their attention. I remember when I first met my wife, I met her outside of a classroom, and uh, what do you know, the next week I just happened to be there again and asking her out on a date. And you know, the, the various things that I've done in pursuing a loving relationship with my wife, I'll tell you some of the great ideas I had for a date didn't pan out. <laughs> you know, somehow, you know, that, you know whatever, it didn't work out. <laughs> I can go through those stories. But God desires for us to make the attempt. To desire to come and to know that relationship with God and to ask the question. So I think as we pursue it, we hear the examples of other people in the scriptures who from time to time have felt that God was nudging them in one particular way. And they had to stop and ask the question, is this really God who's inviting me to move in this way or am I hearing some other message? I don't know how many of you saw the movie Noah recently. I had a chance to watch that uh, recently. It's a horrible film, by the way. But, uh, but there is... It's a little commentary, free of charge, right there. Um, but one of the things that I thought was incredible about this movie was that the main character, Noah, gets a dream. And then he spends the rest of the film trying to make sense of this. It's like, what am I supposed to do with this image in my mind? Is this from God? Or is this from my own mind? Is this real? Or is this something else? And still, throughout the entire movie, gets it wrong <laughs> in terms of how he's supposed to live that out. But he's pursuing and trying to figure that out. I think for all of us, we've asked that question about whether it's a choice and a decision of where we're supposed to go next or what's going on in our agenda for life. We ask, God, what is it that you're doing? What is it you're pursuing? What are you pushing me towards? I've got a sense of it. And so I think if we look at the pattern of Peter in this story, I think we've got a, an interesting pattern here. First is he asks the question, is that really you? It's good to ask the question, is that really you, Lord? It's good to seek. And then second, he, he tests that. Lord, if this is really you, then ask me to respond. This is what I'm feeling, how I'm supposed to respond. Is this really what you want me to do? He puts it out there. Lord, if that's really you, I'm feeling the desire that I'm supposed to jump out of this boat and follow you. Is that what you want me to do? He puts it out there as a question. He doesn't immediately jump out of the boat. I, I want to put that out there because I think it's an important discernment step that we ask God for some confirmation. Sometimes through Scripture we see Gideon. And he says, Lord, you know, I, I've got this fleece. And I'm going to put this out there. And if it's wet one morning and then dry the next morning, I'll know that you're speaking to me. And what do you know what happened? He puts the test out there. Lord, this is what I'm sensing that you're asking me to do. Can you confirm to me that this is what I've heard is correct? Now sometimes in our prayer groups we've been praying for people and we'll ask God to give us some word or image or phrase that might help us know what's going on in the situation. And as we pray, sometimes we say, you know, I'm getting the image of this or I'm getting this image. I'm getting this impression of what this might mean. And we say, we don't say, this is what God's saying. We say, you know, I've got this idea. And, and it might have been my breakfast, but, but I'm wondering if this applies to your life. And sometimes we find that God has worked through people in our prayer team and other small groups speaking to people's lives. God uses us as his disciples with words of knowledge and wisdom, but we experiment with that because we realize that none of us is infallible, that God doesn't just use somebody and we assume that they always get, get it right. I get it wrong more than I get it right. You know? I just want to put it out there. I don't always get it right. But that's part of our discernment process. And I think finally asking, Lord, and just waiting. You know, Peter waited for the response, waiting for God to help share the confirmation of where he's supposed to go. And again, Jesus' phrase of response is, Come! I think what's great about this passage is that as Peter gets out of the boat to follow Jesus, as he's following Jesus, it works out great. But what happens? As soon as he gets distracted by the waves, he begins to sink. And everything seems to come out against him again. And Jesus holds out his hand and grabs him when Peter says, Save me, Lord! What's great about that is recognize that when Peter's focus is on Jesus, when his focus is on a relationship that is developing, Jesus says, come into relationship with me. And as long as he's following Christ, 
things seem to work out. Even though he's walking on water. I don't know if you've done that recently, but it's not an easy thing to do, I'm thinking. But, you know, Jesus, you know, Peter is walking on the water, and so even in the midst of the craziness of life, he's able to continue even above the storm, walking, pursuing Jesus. But as soon as he allows the storm to be his focus, he realizes he's completely awash. He's completely a mess. It's easy for us to get distracted. There's constantly waves of stuff coming against us. But Jesus is asking us, in the midst of all that is to made to be broken, I want you to know who I am. Will you come? Will you follow me? Will you pursue a relationship with me to know who I am? And let everything else become the second priority. Yes, those are important. But if you follow me, I'll help you walk on the water. I'll help you to overcome the storms of your life. I'll help you to know what is true and important than everything else that you might know me. And of course, when we're lost, calling out to Jesus to save me, we'll find Christ with us. We'll find Him present with us in that time of need. What's great about this is the passage ends with the disciples, with Jesus and Peter in the boat, and the disciples, I imagine there's this moment of hush. And all the craziness that's going on, and they're just taking a moment to go, what did we just see? We just saw two men walking on the water. And the disciples' response is that they bow down. And they say, truly, Lord, you are the Son of God. In the entire book of Matthew, this is the only time that the disciples, or any other person who is of Jewish background, and there's later a centurion, but it's the only time that they declare that Jesus is the Son of God. It's like that moment when they finally see him for who he is. A statement of belief comes from that relationship that they now understood in a brand new way. Now, as a church, the boat has always been an interesting example for the church. Because as we pursue what Christ has asked us to do, we often find ourselves along the way <laughs> towards that journey where we know that God is behind us. These various goals or agendas or missions that we are on as a church are all along the way. But the primary piece for us is to trust Christ. To trust that no matter what else assails us, no matter what comes against us as his people, we can trust Christ who is with us. And that he, as the Son of God, is able to uh, uh, do what is needed. To calm the storm. To help us to rise above the circumstances that are around us that we might fulfill what he would have us to be about in this life. I am pray for us that we might be disciples and be faithful in our following him. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this story. We thank you that as Peter is willing to step out of the boat and to follow Jesus, that we as your church might be willing, even in the midst of the craziness that surrounds us, the tragedies, the grief, the loss that surrounds us, to be willing to look to you, to recognize that nothing has a higher priority in our lives than to know you. Lord, we thank you for your continued love for us in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.